Real Estate Roots, a homegrown hustle series. Where, what, where I like that. Okay. Okay. What are we going to talk about? Commercial real estate and how important it is for business. And we'll, and I guess why you want to do that, given all the other things that you're doing. You're doing a lot. Well, I will see. No, why you want to do this podcast that we're going to be cracking. Oh. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I think it's, uh, I just, because we can, we can share. I often help people uh, one-to-one and um, not just real estate, it can be things that you think like, when I just said some really good stuff or the person that wanted me anything like I really, like, I really appreciate that yeah. information or insight. Yeah. And when I hear something from Todd Rucker or something, I think, man, that's worth repeating and sharing with them. Mm-hmm. Or you or whoever do. And I think that Doing this and my blogs allows the message to reach more people. I don't think the average person thinks about, like we do, the importance of access. Tell me what you mean by that. Oh um, man, over, over Christmas, I just heard you hear stories at Christmas. Somebody in our family purchased a house. They sold a house and purchased a house. I think there was a divorce in the middle, but and I'm not going to do houses, of course, but. You know, the builder told them they're selling the house for three fifty, so just go buy another house for three fifty. But the person's divorce so doesn't have her husband's income anymore just because the house was paid for. Because yeah. then you go and buy another three hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter the details of that story as much as this poor person. And I don't really know if I want to feel sorry for her in a way because it's like you're forty five years old and you haven't like tried to learn something how money works, uh, whether it's your favorite subject or not, you know, you know, I, I gotta learn about take a shower and get dressed every day because it's probably not socially acceptable if I don't like clean myself. Yeah, it's not a full-time job. Yeah. It's not a full-time <laughs> job, it's not what I do. But you have to have a level of interest in money just to be able to make it to me. So anyway, so we, so bad is access. It's, I think it's amazing how many people you know that just don't have anybody to ask for advice mm-hmm. or they're asking for advice from somebody they think that maybe that person is trying to help them out. Yeah. That person's yeah, Uncle Bob doesn't know anybody. Right? Yeah. Like, it could be worse off. It could be worse off. So, and not being like you know anything. I think it's just that, we, that you know everything, or that I know everything. Share it. I just shared a podcast with a friend this morning about being a father. And he was like, "Wow, that, that was really, really good." Yeah. Well, that's why I shared it with you because it hit me. You know, mm-hmm. stuff. He's like, "After I was, I really need to work on some mm-hmm. things." And that's why I shared it, because when I heard it, it kind of hit me right between the eyes. I should have sent it to you. I mm-hmm. sent it to like five people. But it was meaningful to me. I shared it with them. But they don't realize that the knowledge that we're trying to gain each and every day by reading books, listening to podcasts, and doing the things we do to get to a higher level, like, that's a part of life. Mm-hmm. And sharing that with others around is a part of life, too. So... I think if you just have a job and you go day by day and you think that your bank or your insurance company all these people are going to take care of you. I think there was a time for that in the 70s and early 80s. Well, mm-hmm. today, they might be people are going to beat you to the punch. And yeah, that's a good deal. So this particular person that I initially was talking with, this gal, didn't have a lot of life experiences. And probably her husband handled a lot of those things. And well, she's got to learn later. I'm a state agent for him, by just trying to make a fee. And, uh, you know, the beauty of my commercial estate business is that, yes, we get paid fees and sometimes very large fees. But then the brokerage is the oxygen of the business, but it's not, uh, you know, do I care if I already get fees? Well, certainly at some point you're going to make some money, but it's not what drives me at all. But, uh, sharing, teaching people is really what, it does, especially at this point in my life. Yeah, and you could, like, I can see that from the outside looking in, like, you're growing your team and doing that at a very fast rate. So it's not like you're just saying, yeah, I like to help people and coach them and give them that access you're talking about. Like you're actually doing it and you're taking time out of your day and energy 
that you would otherwise spend other places and putting it into to people. Uh, and it's, I mean, you can see the result of it. They're paying for themselves. It's probably not the easiest thing as you're going through it. As you know, it's, growing a company is not easy, but the reward is. It's so tough. I mean, you're talking about, um, I was talking to somebody this morning about, you didn't see your kids in the morning. This person went to work really early. And uh, he's, he's got twins, and he doesn't see them in the morning. And he gets home late at night, maybe he sees them for an hour. And when you're young, you can do that, but you're going to really regret that move. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think where I was going with that thought. <laughs> um, time. Yeah, it's really time. And oh, I know. So often I will spend time, my, so my time, I get to see my son morning and night, I love him all the time. But Sometimes, even with my wife, I may be short because I'm busy. Man, if somebody comes to me and they're going through some challenges in life, I just shut down completely and help them out. And it's probably not good. I got to work on that, but it, it's really, but that's what drives me. Like, like sometimes if my wife asks me something, saying, I'm like, well, you should know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But when I really see somebody in pain because I've kind of came from that pain, my background is not, I'm not a silver spoon guy. Probably struggling probably more than anybody in college. And uh, pretty amazing how far I've come. I'm not the same person I used to be. I'm proud to say that. Nobody should be the same person I used to be. But some people continue to remain the same. And uh, so that's really a gift to encourage people. And for me, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think the attraction that some people see is that I wasn't given any of this. You know, people, especially people that know me three years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago. If I don't see somebody for a couple of years, they're just like, Cow. Well, look how far we've come in two years. You know, mm -hmm. it's just when you're doing something like that, that every single day, it's just rewarding. But half my time is spent doing things like this. We're giving back right now, but we would share our stories. Half your time, yeah. yeah. And the other thing, just I'd say to so many people that these other people that we that, that I'm talking about that do not have the access, when I sit down and help them. I learned just as much. As mm -hmm. I may be the guy with all the financial knowledge to be able to fix it. But they know shit too. That you, yeah, that's what I'm know. saying. So, so that's so it's, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. and, and the feeling of you know the rewards of it. I had you know two weeks ago. A friend of mine called me. And she he's like you have to talk to Jeff. You'll help me. She's just crying. You know, I'm like we'll give me the information. Start a spreadsheet. She didn't want to make a spreadsheet. Even though she uses Excel at work, she just doesn't really at home. And uh, so I just quick hammered it out for again, taking my time. Like, as I'm paying people to do those tasks in my company, I'm taking my time to create the most simple spreadsheet to help somebody out. But by the time I got done with her, with everything, and she, not done, it's never done. Yeah. But she was like, just completely shocked. You know, she actually had some net worth and thought she was just crumbling. You should, uh, it's that perspective shift, right? When you don't have knowledge, you don't know what ones to really look through things and, and view yourself but like that event where right there sounds like a good one where you don't know enough to realize how much that you know and sometimes somebody like yourself helping you see those numbers in a spreadsheet or in a different light it just changes how you feel about stuff and that's really powerful because we get like stuck in our own little box and the only way to kind of break out of that is to read books and do podcasts or to talk with people and actually be open and willing to change perspective based off of the new information you're getting you know what i mean like you could do all that with this chick and she just ignores you for whatever reason or just thinks you know everything blah 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 but in reality she would miss an opportunity to learn and grow there. And a lot of people do that to themselves. I percent and I can't tell you the, uh, the amount of times I have sat down with somebody and really helped them and they just <clears> completely <throat> go away. You However, know. there's people that have helped me that I probably went away. And I know now they know where I'm at and they're just extremely mm -hmm. proud. You know, they do call it out and mention it. So I don't know. But the good news is the uh, particular person I was talking about did make some money in those states. So she had some uh, Yeah. Smart to buy some uh, Single family houses. So, even though she, and I know that we're kind of trying to focus on real estate somewhat, but even though she knew nothing about real estate, she had the, the means to pick up a few townhomes and really 
that's what's going to save her during this time of struggle. I appreciate it. She has a lot, way more equity than she imagined. You know. That's awesome. And didn't understand. She just thought the money she was making was from the rents. People don't know how to think about it. They don't understand the tax, the tax advantages. All right. Let's get it. Let's do a five, four, three, two, one start. And then I'll I do she a well. She was already starting. Oh, we've been going. This will be ended out. But as far as this will probably be like sizzle reel type stuff. Super real. Am I allowed to them? I think so. It's too chill here. These couches are way better. The, the black cards are look nice, but these are more comfortable. So we're going for we it. Did it just for you. you. Right? This is all for, for you, Joe. All right. Here we go. Jeff Salzgren, thanks again for coming out here. Looking forward to having more conversations like this with you on the homegrown hustle. Here in Forest Lake, right between Christmas and the New Year. Again, right around the holiday season. And we're still find the time to get together and talk about some hustle. So appreciate you taking the time to come out here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. The roads were good driving up here. Yeah. So no snow this year. It's fascinating. Years, it is, I'm like halfway to my cabin and uh, I just keep going. Yeah. I just, that's awesome. Man. I didn't know if the ski resorts are open. So. so coming to the end of 2023 and having had such, like, such a big year yourself, what are like a couple, like one or two of the bigger wins that you've had for yourself and fortunate equities this year? Well, I think, uh, I feel like the luckiest person won like every day is a win. You know, you just gotta keep grinding. We just, we just had a meeting with Aaron Rube talking about that our team, talking about all the little things, all the people that work for us that they do, how to oh, help no. us, and actually create some of the amazing deals that we get done this year. I think that, um, you know, Everybody wins at a different level in our company. Like, if we purchase a building, my partners and I, it creates continuing opportunities for our management people to grow and block the line. Mm -hmm. It kind of elevates everybody. We try to run the company where like everybody wins and we're all equal and there's not this hierarchy. But uh, some of the greatest things we did this year, if you're at the bigger deals, they're not coming at the big deals. I think some of the smaller deals we did were, uh, you know, we, I had a couple of years where we had built some families that were just really in a jam of mine. And in my heart, those are the big wins that when I see an opportunity, I help somebody out and I know that some other broker, not that brokers are bad, but somebody really could have taken advantage of some of these people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those really stand out this year. This company will grow significantly. I had the opportunity to hire somebody about a year and a half ago. And I was like, I'm there. I'm always looking to hire, but I guess I'm never really actually hiring somebody. Mm -hmm. There's this attraction of people in our company that the right person usually just gets put in front of us. And it's hard a, as a small business to take on people, pay them, and train them. And I was pretty much capped out at the time this particular person came along. I just, it's, it's Adam. And uh, we are a better known business, serves to say a better known small business. I've heard that acronym, you know, on and off over the years. I thought that just letting people know that I was a veteran might have some significance or help. And kind of went down that lane for a while earlier in my career. It's not that helpful. I think on Veterans Day, people say, thanks for your service, and that's all awesome. But it didn't go much further than that. But there are some programs out there, and there are some deals that we can go after that other brokers cannot. Yeah. And brokerage, the people in this business, their fathers are usually paying for them to go to college. And we're not just saying, hey, why don't you go into service first hmm. and get into the, uh, get into commercial estate. Usually they just go to St. Thomas. St. Cloud State, the working man's college used to have a program. <laughs> I got to get rid of it. But anyway, um, I hired this person. I said, hey, I have this certification. Actually, I didn't even know if I had it completed yet. And it, it was a grueling process, and I think it kind of helped me finalize that. And I kind of put them in a business development role, going to find these government possibilities, mm -hmm. which enabled us to get into the Minneapolis School District. We are their broker. The rising Honeyoka had the district, so the biggest districts were working on St. Paul, City of Sartell, we used a couple different city things. And then just recently started working with the federal government, and I uh, was got kind of one of our first government contracts and we keep hauling away at those. Those are very secure contracts we have. And 
you know, the building got it going in. So it's one thing to own real estate. It's another thing to government as your tenant. You know, yeah. those, you know, those checks are coming through. So. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a pretty awesome year and a half. I mean, I know a lot about Adam's background and the, the caliber individual that he is. And when we first started talking about that whole program and the, the veteran owned businesses or the veteran owned opportunities through the government, the first thing I thought is this is a massive undertaking for anybody, especially somebody who's not even in the space that you're trying to get this contract for, right? And Adam put his head down and made it happen. So he's one of them. Yeah, that's well, amazing individuals that you have with very diverse. I felt pretty bad, sort of, Eve, because when I told, like, I was so happy to have my board, but yet I was like, sit back there, figure it out. I don't have time to help you. And it was kind of like putting a kid, it was like making a crank for a test. And it took him a few months, not just to figure it out, you know, and to get all the stuff and play the video play. But I can tell you, Matt, if I told you, go do this thing, yourself or turn running a business the way you're doing today. It was impossible for me to do, I couldn't, well, I don't want to say, not everything's possible, right? but for me to run a business, and at the time I'm still doing a lot of developer in June, and I was bringing on other people at the time, so I'm trying to make payroll too, which means I got to do more brokerage. It is the oxygen of our business. I had dabbled in trying to figure it out in years past. And every time I dabbled, it was like a rabbit hole because it's so much information. And they talked, the feds and everything speak in acronyms and I, I'm hoping, I kind of hope I never need to understand yeah. that. And, and like, oh. <laughs> but then one thing, as we kind of got the, some of the school district stuff, and the reason we got the school district stuff was 100% based on my background and everything that I knew. But, I mean, mm -hmm. there are, I think in the state of Minnesota, we are the only veteran owned commercial real estate brokerage. Now, are there others across? I think there's some people that hold that title in the state of Minnesota, but are they doing the bigger deals that we're doing, the big, huge industrial deals? I don't think so. There's national people. But when we got the city of Minneapolis contract, we had quite some warehouse and forms and things like that. And really, my background, my connections with the Netbridge community, they able us to handle that very well. And, and uh, we have a pretty big deal done with them. And we're still working on some, some school buildings. And, and so then that just branches off to other opportunities. Yeah. So now we can say, we do a lot of government, you know, we're really revamping our, our uh, website a little bit. But now you're doing federal stuff, you're doing school district stuff, we're, we're starting to work for some of the cities. It's kind of like a separate business onto itself, mm -hmm. their business. So that's one of the big things this year. And then I just think continuing to hire other people are bred in. When you're, and I know you are a one, one to two person company at one point. Mm -hmm. When you're one to two people and you're putting out social media, Versus having your whole team involved in doing that. Sometimes you're like, wow, we're here, we're there. Some of say, yeah, I saw a sign of you somewhere. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Because so, mm -hmm. it just starts to kind of, actually, I think time in business, more people, and then more how social media is grabbing onto it. Then you and I are both part of the same BNI. Mm -hmm. It's massively significant. So, one thing that is unique about Portal Equities Group on the social media side of things is I've met. A lot of other people in that space and the social media activity is not, it's not the best. Like the, yours compared to other businesses, even ones that are hundreds of times bigger than yours. It's like, it looks like the budget for yours is so much greater because you're actually just putting content out. And is there, first of all, like why in the commercial real estate space or commercial management space, like why is that a thing? How come there isn't more like authentic content out there for people to kind of learn and develop their understanding of commercial real estate. Yeah, it's, it's, um, commercial real estate used to be this big home gray hair boys club. You know, it really was, they were thousand dollar suits. If you had a little Lexus, you wanted the bigger Lexus, mm -hmm. you had a little BMW, you wanted the big BMW. And you kind of had to wear a thousand dollar suit to go to showings. It was a pretty tight group, hard to break into business. Well, it's really changing a lot in the last probably five to eight years. When I first went to Essence Real Estate Services, which is Jeff Norris's company, a great mm -hmm. friend of mine, great company, ERSI, they didn't even have a website. And that was in 2009 when I first went on my own. That's when CBG started and I partnered with them for a while. So I 
signed up for a web page for us and I started pulling out all these things just so we were actually on the internet so we could be found. And I started our LinkedIn page, I think a Facebook page. So when I really launched out on my own in 2020 during COVID, before I did so, I, I really, it was very fast, but I had to make sure I had a CDT LinkedIn page, mm -hmm. Facebook page and things like that. So not too long after that, I joined BI and met Todd Looker, who uh, was one of your coaches as mm -hmm. well. And Todd told me that I needed to do a newsletter or a blog or something. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was absolutely out of his mind because no good. Really, there's some residential people that are crossing over and commercial residential people way into the social media compared to the commercial people. Because the very commercial people, I think, work for some of the larger companies. Mm -hmm. They're expecting the company to do that for them. And I think those brokers, they are all my colleagues, and I hope they're watching this because they're mm -hmm. some of my greatest friends. And commercial estate's one of those weird industries where we compete, but we also really help each other a lot. Like, you have to work together to get a deal done. You do. But if somebody needs a document or help authoring some legal spiel stuff, I'm always, you know, somebody just called me yesterday to help me out. It was mm -hmm. a back and forth thing. But the, I think that these, these, these guys that are at some of these larger companies, I don't think they're on the leading. They don't ever envision leaving and going out on their own. And they're, they got to hunt big elephants because they got to get big deals to make fees. Mm -hmm. And so some of them that I know, they do own commercial real estate and still work for the larger colleagues mm -hmm. and CB. I can't really say much about it because they're kind of tied down by the big corporate company, you know, and if they're out there tooting their horn, they even there could be something in their contracts or things like that. So again, when I first started uh, thinking about doing it, I thought there, there's no way. And some of those guys that I really, really hold in high regard, I thought we're going to make fun of me. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's like I'm very confident what I do, but like when you're going to start saying, Details about the business, these people become very competitive. Like, oh, he doesn't know what he's trying to go on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. And it was the exact opposite. Those exact people, I thought that would be critical, are the people that every Friday are sending me a text being like, that this is, is awesome. awesome. Jeff, I saw you in the San Diego shoveling sidewalks. I wasn't even still. Like, that was the funniest video mm -hmm. ever. And it works. And so that fear goes away. And then the fear goes away so much that. And you start to just think, well, like, what do I care? Like, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, but like, I was like, I was like, before you be critical, let me see your financial statement, mm -hmm. right? Like, is this worth it? And then the power of the phone calls when you get calls from people out of Boston, California, Arizona, Florida, that they found us on Google. How do you find us before you find CBRE or you know, one of the GLO or one of the big shots? So it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, somebody just said to me, like, I saw your website. It's the most amazing website around, you know? I'm like, I think it's, I think it's, it's on. It is a great it's website. Way, it's, I know it's way over the top, but I see it every day. So mm -hmm. just got it, it doesn't, it changes frequently. I don't know all the changes, but Dan Marie and our team does an amazing job. I mean, the great part is, is we can update our website for the next 30 seconds if I just send a text rate. Mm -hmm. It need change. And so having those people on the team, on board, ready to make changes, ready to list people's properties. It's just super important. So, first of all, thank, like, I'm gonna go back to the whole veteran one thing. Thank you for your service. You probably don't get thanked enough for that. I know. I'm uh, thankful for my service now. I get more benefits. I got one deal done out of that. It, uh, I think it's gonna pay me like way more than I could have made if I stayed for a thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is there anything that you learned in service that you find yourself thinking about as you're going through growing your business? So I'm 54 years old and I say that because I think I am becoming the voice of wisdom at some point here that you do not realize many of the lessons you've learned like these the people that I sit in front of and talk to right now the young people that are struggling they may not appreciate what I'm telling them right now they may appreciate it 20 years. Maybe they pick up the phone or send me a text that. So there's things in the military of you know, never quitting. And you know, for a fact, if we had to do some push ups right now, I'm going to beat your ass. <laughs> Just so. <laughs> because we don't give up. You like me. But you know what I'm saying? Like, but I'm back up. 
So there's things about that and the that you don't realize when you get out of the military. And now when you think back in the military, you only remember the good stuff, even though there was a lot of bullshit. Mm-hmm. But the reasoning for that BS now of why they did it and why they had the systems and how they do it, now that you're running a team and you're running a company, kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's kind of how they have to do it. And then, you know, soon after getting out of the military, I started working with John Hill. And I just remember, like, if he only knew how much $200 would help me each pay cycle, right? I think everybody goes through at some point in their life. But you know what I would have done with 200 more hours? I would drink $200 more beer, right? And so that would made me a better, like, now knowing what he knew, he was really trying to help me. You know, giving mm-hmm. somebody, just giving somebody money. Money is not everything. I mean, but he gave me the lessons. He gave me the opportunity. In every deal I get done right now, the, the, it almost brings tears to my eyes sometimes about how lucky was I that he took a chance on me and talked me into this crazy business that's just been absolutely unbelievable. I think I, somebody just said the other day, if you talk to any uh, accountant, they will say that their clients with the most money, they, they yeah. owned real estate or had something to do with real estate. Yeah, so you think about that. Like, and I was going to be an anesthetist. So I just loved helping people. I was on the trauma response team at the hospital, worked in EIOR and all these great positions. And then, you know, John was, I was dating his man and we're down in Naples and he's like, you can help people with commercial estate. I was like, you can? You just didn't, didn't click with me. He just connected. But things like, I'll get you in, I can make some phone calls up to St. Claude. I'll get you into the real estate program. You're going to go to school there. But he had no kind of grades I had. Like, there's, there's a way of getting into the business program. So it sounds like he was an influence in your life in a similar way to how you influence other people. God, it's like he connected a dot for you that you didn't think it was feasible. And I've seen you do that for multiple people where it, where in it thinks that a uh, property or even the thought of owning a property is not even in the same, same sphere, right? They didn't even think it's reality. And then, by knowing a few things and connecting the dots, you open this whole new door to them in their life, but now they can change their life if they go through it. And yeah, by the way, powerful, man. It, it was a one chance jump to two, it was like about 15 in a row. <laughs> I was playing with us. He probably, he's probably kind of, yeah, those you ever ask him why he did, why he did that? Like, what did he, what did he see in you? You know, you know I think that, uh, you know, I just never forget one of the first chances I got to do something for him. I was working at the hospital almost full time with a point eight and going to school and I was getting ready to go all the way. He's like, what are you doing? I mean, it's my day off. You know, he's in college, you should be, you know, working, studying or mm-hmm. whatever, you know. I was like, man, this guy's kind of pushy. <laughs> and, uh, and I went to this building and I and I was doing some demos with some guys. And you know there's twelve guys running around tearing some sheetrock walls down to like twenty four feet high. I'm trying, I'm trying to walk around and I had riding a horse. All I had was a motorcycle for like a year or so after the service. He said, like, yeah, I go up 694 down Shingle Creek. I don't even know where 694 is. I've been out of the military. <laughs> and then we didn't have phones and all that. So you go up to the old map and get this building. So I was born to work. I mean, my dad brought me up, my stepdad. Did. I had to work very, very hard. And work ethic was a big thing. I grew up in a very blue car. But so these guys are like tearing down all this whole dumpster. I'm like, where are you? What are you, what prep school do you find these games mm-hmm. out of, you know? And I mean, I'm running laps, like for every piece of sheetrock, I'm taking 10 to their one. And they all left at like two o'clock because the dumpster was full. So no big deal. Let's keep getting the wall down and pile it up by the dock door. It's the du- next dumpster's coming mm-hmm. tomorrow, you know? And uh, I think later that night, John stopped by to see how it was going because he, he didn't see me come back because my girlfriend lived like an apartment within his house at Lake Isles. You didn't see my motorcycle come back, and also he showed up at about eight o'clock at night. I'm still tearing down the walls, and it was just things like that that I didn't need to call him and ask him what to do next. In that and moment, was, were you thinking about? Were you thinking about? Oh, I hope John sees this, or were you just thinking no, about the task at hand? No, absolutely not. Saying, you know, I was. Just, it was just who I was, who I was wearing to be. Like, I wasn't trying to make that guy. I didn't know who the guy was. I needed that eight bucks now and more than it's a mark wall. Anyway, you know, you're just always looking for a way. You, you know, I didn't grow up with 
my dad would tell me all the time, I'm proud of you, or you know, all that kind of stuff. So I was looking for it. You know, I mean, I was looking for it on my paper up soon. But fast forward here. So those lessons, they leak out years later. The way I feel about it anyway, I feel like that even just some of the, there are moments, there are cards that John wrote to me at Christmas time and put in words that I still have saved. And I go back and I look at those and read them. Mm-hmm. And it makes me think about what to tell my people today. But he really did believe in me. And, you know, I mean, I had I had lost my driver's license and I got people on my team that that happened to them. I'm not saying like I can be run over and more tolerant, but he gave me a chance. He gave me a lot of chances. Uh, and, and then I was thinking about the smart stuff, just reading her talking about it, this exact thing. And then I'm working with Jeff Normans. And Rafik Moore calls me. Rafik Moore owns Caspian Group and uh, pretty well known name to yeah. in town. He yeah. it. He's like a mini John Hill. And uh, he calls me up and wants to go to lunch. And actually, Jeff Norris answered the phone and said, yeah, he must be talking about Salzburg. And uh, I answered the phone, and Rafik's got a little bit of an accent. He's, and um, he wants to go to lunch. And I just keep thinking today, had I not been there, I grabbed that phone call. And I knew about him because I'd seen that post on social media. And I knew he was friends on social media and LinkedIn. I looked at him, looked him up on LinkedIn. Well, some of these brokers that I really looked up to, and even some friends of John Hill, and said, this guy could be, must be a decent dude. And I'm going to lunch with him. We sat down at lunch. We weren't even at lunch. This is 2017. I remember it was like sleeting and shitty off. And he pulled up in a Tesla. And there were a lot of Teslas. No. And I had a Tesla in work for like a year. Waiting for my Tesla. So that was number one for me. I was like, wow, this guy's actually, so I just, but the, to me, and I'm not like into cars or anything, but I was like, it's not some other broke broke and just called me for lunch. And when I didn't sit, sat down, he said, when are we going to buy a building? Like he didn't say, so you married him, you kids, you actually looked over at my plate where I have the face, like, you're eating like shit. I thought about that. I went, when are we going to buy a building? <laughs> there really was like, I had like a salad. It was like a salad place. It was like I had like tater tots. Yeah. Out play, you know? And we did say that. And then we, uh, he said, well, we're going to buy a building together. And I'm like, you got me mixed up. You got the wrong guy here. I worked for John Allen. I was not mm-hmm. John Allen's partner, you know. And, uh, you know, at the time, I had saved up some money, some, some broker money. And in fact, as I'm sitting here and he's saying this, prior to walking into the meeting, I had a building under contract with John Allen. It was about a million bucks. And John had sent me an email that day and said, I don't want to ruin your Christmas, but I don't think we're going to be closing on that bill on this particular building. And I knew that kind of walking into this meeting with me, but I couldn't tell Rafik that. One week later, Rafik and I had that building together 50 50 in the contract. And so, as much as I love John Allen, I know I love Rafiq too, because Rafiq got me into the mindset of abundance. And John was building John's wealth. I was helping John do that. Rafiq is helping people become wealthy all around him. He's just a different, different person. I'm not really comparing the two. I'm just saying, this was my next being in the right place at the right time. So we bought that building. During due diligence, we sold that building, which is also known as arbitrage. So we sold it, made power money, yeah, bought yeah. another opportunity, and another opportunity. And then I would call Rafiq and he said, I don't want your any deals unless they're three to six million. And I'm like, oh boy. But we still we still did a couple. And then he's like, I'm in the six to ten range now, I think he's in the twenty to thirty range. I keep thinking he probably he might. we tied up a lot of properties, bought some properties, sold some properties, sold some properties again. He was the probably the second most important person that believed in me. And he holds me in super high regard as well because he's kind of the master of putting the deals together because I have the experience on what to do next, you know, kind of once we have it. And so um, we were we were a duo. We still are. I mean, we're, still, we're still really great friends. So you didn't and, know before that phone call? No, not all. You of his company? And so it's not like you. We had it after that lunch. <clears throat> one week later, we had a. Uh, it was actually Brescia's and Dickie Town. We put Brescia's hmm. in the contract. Credit. 
Yeah, enough too. And I know there's been over 20. The purchase sold 20 buildings since then. It's still in the room. We're looking at all about 20, I think. Now, what's the date to the end? It close on <laughs> two more buildings here by the end of the year. Got to end fourth quarter strong. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's crazy. Um, we're always looking for buildings to buy. And Luffy taught me some of the part of the means of actually buying. Even though I went I was with John. So with John, we were building new developments. We're buying land, putting up fat gun buildings. We need to put up fat gun buildings. We didn't have a nine or anybody. We got all the tent. We did all the build outs, the brokerage. We did the management for the house. So after meeting Rafiq, my brokerage obviously went to where can I find more, more opportunities to buy? And once I learned how to buy, I just became an entirely different broker. That's when I was able to help out people like you and my friends. And hey, listen, if I can buy a building, anybody can buy a building. The, the ticket bill was having the experience to manage them. Mm -hmm. You know, John only managed it for So that's when I say, that's when you go back and you're so grateful for all those opportunities, right? Without, with Rafiq showing me how to buy buildings or buying buildings, with Rafiq, that doesn't, you may go out and buy buildings. I got doctors all the time with a lot of money on them. You wouldn't buy these buildings. But if you don't know how to manage them or understand how the asset works, that's where you can get yourself into some trouble. So, what are some of the mistakes people make when mismanaging a property? They suck all the money out of the property. You can, and I, I've got a lot of things that have done that. Some get lucky, some of them don't. Mm -hmm. Mismanaging can be it can be a lot of things. Number one, you can just pay, pay a management company, and they might not do as good a job as you can do yourself. Mm -hmm. We ended up starting our management company this spring just because we had some great management companies over for us, and we had some really bad management companies that we trust. Mm -hmm. And what was your question? I just want to <laughs> what are some of the mistakes people make? Oh, okay, so. It, like you can overpay to plow and wash your windows at a building. And if you own the asset and you only have a tenant there for three to five years and you're spending all your money on the wrong areas, mm -hmm. you have to make sure you're taking care of your curb appeal. Some of it's timing when your tenant's in the building and some of the things you gotta take care of. Like obviously, if your tenant's going out, we're sitting right now, week after Christmas before New Year's Eve, next spring, if you have a tenant leaving, we pay time between spring in the fall, you want to make damn sure you're striping your parking lots or fitting those types of things into this year's budget mm -hmm. so that it's at least a look fresh that year. We want to look fresh every year. Well, that's some of the things that come next when it comes to property management, right? Because you, like, you were around the brokerage and all that, right? But you were really with John Allen in property management and yeah, like, we managed a over three months developing and all of the kind of general contractor type of timeline associated with that. Yeah. So John Allen built his empire a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. And he was kind of the main guy. And then there's this evolution and now there's like so many partnerships that are going on and Rafiq kind of opened that door to you. What's the benefit of, of purchasing a building in partnership with somebody as opposed to trying to do it yourself? Yeah, so John Allen felt one key partner, I'd say. And not to talk about school about it, you know, he did most of the stuff himself, which mm -hmm. was great. But I'm going to do the same. I did a blog a while back, and uh, you go to cgspaces.com to find all my blogs and stuff. I do blogs and shorts, but I did one. I think it was a short about share the pizza. And that's, I think, what I call mm -hmm. it. I, I try to write my blogs and my uh, shorts so that people can really uh, understand them. And if I can't go buy a building myself, but we all want to go, we're all talking about investing and how can we find a deal if i can't find what like if i can't go to that higher level alone if i don't have the choice then i want to take on a partner because if i don't take on a partner then i don't do the deal mm -hmm. so they taught so such well if you can't do it if there's no other option at least do something mm -hmm. and so for me my partnerships now have just been very strategic and i love having partners i mean for now and where I'm at and where, where I need to be and where I'm trying to go. I'm not trying to be, you know, you're never trying to be John you know. I'm not trying to set myself short either. I think that, I think you make a lot of money having partners if you have the right partners. Mm -hmm. and I just got some, my partners are people that 
they have come into my company, so they're helping me grow the company, and they have a piece of what we need to continue mm -hmm. growing the company. We all have our strengths, and we really try to play the strengths within our company. And uh, we're, not, we're bringing people on to win. So the partnership with Rafiq was, he taught me the business, you know what I mean? It's like, I knew a lot, he, he knew. So he could have found some other guy to do it for sure, right? But he knew of my knowledge and what I know and my insight that I'm a great partner. He doesn't have to babysit me. But he handled the figuring out all the structure of the deal. Mm -hmm. He was very creative like that. And so took those lessons and moved on and used some of those lessons with some of the partners I have now and just continue to teach. And, and what happens is, is now people want me to be in and a part of their deals, right? Sure. Be a part of so they're finding the deals for us. And uh, more opportunities. Coming as the expert. Yeah. And the other thing is like, there's a lot of people that buy buildings this town. There's not a lot of small groups that are buying buildings. The John Airwood building, newer buildings, I'm buying ugly pigs, you know. They're tearing ugly pigs down every single day to build another part of the John Plex. Mm -hmm. And we really see a need in the area of small spaces. People just can't seem to find space or they don't want to pay for pretty. And right now, and so just because of my experience, my background with construction, I've seen the numbers changing over the years. Paint and carpet used to be like, yeah, I can use the paint and carpet. I mean, you know, paint and carpet is not like a major construction cost. Hmm. So, can we talk about that? But yeah, that's, we're always looking for partners. So, within the commercial real estate space, let's just talk about like the brokerage side of it, where people are actually purchasing buildings. Like, What's the supply and demand look like right now? So I think, uh, I don't think I've watched the news since 2020. It's <laughs> <laughs> not a wonder saying out there. I do go to continuing education, and uh, we got some great ones in this town. Everybody always, when they hear that the office market is bad, that's because somebody on the news you know, said something about the downtown towers or the IDS. There's a lot of buildings that are not the downtown towers or the IDS. There is a, a ton of opportunity. Industrial is very strong. But I think the difference today, so I grew up building portfolio quality buildings that were designed and I helped design them so they were demisable. Anywhere from that 2,000 square feet to 10,000 square foot base and Today, you cannot build buildings that small. If you look around, and I'm, talk, I'm just specifically talking about industrial. Office is a little soft downtown, but I personally own some office buildings that are not downtown, and we're doing phenomenal. We're doing really well. We're doing well for our clients that we actually lease their spaces and within our own portfolio. So industrial, though, is being taken over. All these little buildings that our fathers and grandfathers built these little five and 10,000 square foot buildings sprinkled around town. Nobody's building them anymore. You can't afford to build them anymore because of the requirements of ponding, environmental, mm -hmm. and most all this craziness. So what you see is the buildings going up in Maple Grove, the 200,000 square foot mass cubic boxes, yeah. So when I got into this business back in uh, the early 90s, Rates were like $4 net for a warehouse and maybe 8 or 9 for an office. And we could take a shell and build it out and actually lease them for that. You just can't do that anymore. But the rates stayed the same for my first 20 years in this business. They barely moved at all. And now they're moving significantly for industrial. So but it's the construction costs that are driving those numbers. But there's this huge gap. You know, everybody's building this bulk. And even though those buildings are they're still somewhat designed, to break down bay by bay, they're not going to do it. They're just looking so they can break it down on the bay line. So they'll take a 100,000 square foot user and a 50,000 square foot user and yeah. break it down twice. But these are big, huge distribution type facilities. So there's nowhere to go for the guy that's coming out of his garage trying to go find some small space. Or, and uh, yeah, I know you've been there. So those are the spaces that that I kind of like, I like the bigger, I'm on the bigger things now, but mm -hmm. I first really enjoy those. You get the less, you don't get the people that have credit, but their their buildings, if you can find them, they're worth buying because it cannot be reproduced, you know. So it's like a, a rookie card. It's like a rare card from some 
athlete. Like it's Keith Emily. Yeah, I mean, if you see a small building going up right now, it's Chase Bank, you know, or it's a little caribou station. It's not Joe's yeah. electric. Yeah. You know, a nice little 4,000 square foot brick building with a door he can pull his van in. And I mean, my well, it'll almost pull your van in. And you better put in the biggest city's going to make you put in a small sure. system, firearm system. What if you pull an electric car on the camp of the fire out? You know, they're just going crazy. And you just rattle off a few things that nobody even thinks about. I know I haven't until like you're in a building and you're owning it and you think you can do something, but really there's all these drills that it's you don't even know. So all these nice fancy buildings that we're building today, they, they all have fancy irrigation systems and lawns and maintenance that all these companies that service those buildings I had nowhere to go with their equipment. You know, when I was, it's kind of crazy. They had a paper on Howard Fair, a real estate tycoon up in Anoka. His name was John Weber. And uh, he's since passed away, but I know his son Jeff is still around up there. The fact that I got into real estate, you know, and I was working, I was more than a part of parking lots. It's still got it all full circle. But I know several people that start lawn and snow farm companies. And it's a very lucrative business if you know what you're doing. But I also know people have been in a long time. And it's not once you get to a certain growth point. It's where are you going to put your equipment? You can't park it up at Rock Creek. You need and every time it snows, run down and get you know, and there's and uh, so many properties of the zoning. You can't park a trailer with lawn equipment. You can't back the snowplow truck into the building and work on it. They're not gonna allow you to it will, but you gotta flam away straps, you know, your makeup. So it's just getting, it's becoming very, very hard. Unless you have some of these quiet little sleepy buildings, like, you know, you have a couple of awesome ones. I got a couple of pretty awesome buildings. Yeah, thanks to your help. So people that are in commercial real estate, they kind of stay in commercial real estate, right? Not a lot of people hopping around. When I do see people hop around, in, it's usually within the space. They go from one larger broker or management company over to another and then maybe to another like yes so first of all that we've been through some cycles that even when i was younger man i know a lot of the guys at cb commercial used to work in the dayton's warehouse at night because yeah. it's a delayed gratitude business the deals don't come right away but we're seeing a transition too. some residential groups are really becoming commercial push and you know back in the day if you tried to call a broker at CB, and you don't even answer the phone. I keep using CB because it's a common one. Mm -hmm. There's there's several cars all the shops. Today, you really got to respect those residential brokers that are doing commercial deals because their their families may have migrated to the United States and sold them their first house because mm -hmm. they became a lawyer and then they had a building and then they sold it. So we really try to work on those relationships because you don't you're not going to get a lot of deals done, but they stay. Most people stay in this business. You don't hear too many people getting out. It's really which ones blossom and start to actually buy commercial real estate. And that's that not transition. There. There's not a lot. Of, and I'd say for for me, I'd say there's not a lot of them that come from my background. There's the, the ones that I know that do own several buildings or Rafiq's background. Rafiq's background was houses and he went to buildings. There's not too many guys that don't have uh, grandpa died and left him a million dollars or that are known in town as owners and brokers and that own their own brokerage firms and things like that. So it's so pretty scary when you go to, like when I went out on my own, my intentions were, I'm just going to go out on my own and be a broker and get an assistant. And that's it. And bring in my half a million dollars a year and call it good. So that's quite that was my market. That was 10 people ago. Yeah. <laughs> or 10 to 12. So why are people that are in the commercial real estate space, whether it's brokers or managers, how come how come there aren't more of them that buy commercial real estate if they understand it at a higher level than anybody else in the, in society? In my head, it makes the most sense that those would be people that go into ownership. But yeah, I think what but what happens with some of them is I think they get into some deals where if they're not with the bigger firms. The very firms used to be a lot different, but now there's a lot of rules that when they send their contracts. Because mm -hmm. they used to roll their commissions into deals, and that's how you get to be a part of a small deal, part of a small yeah. deal, part of a little piece of the pie here and there. And, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. I think that they get paid 
So a lot of them will go shop to shop. Like we'll give you a five hundred thousand dollar sign and bonus unit part if you come over to our firm. But then you got to produce. Mm -hmm. There's agreements within that five hundred. So you and I might as well go to the bank and take out a loan for five hundred and try to become pokers. I mean, like, go. Yeah. We don't owe anybody. You know, we owe the bank. It's the same thing. They owe their company that loyalty. They're giving. They're not giving them the five hundred. You know, they're gonna get the five hundred back. Really? Yeah. I mean, you get like right. You get a sign of more than five hundred thousand dollars. It's like, extra money, but you got to make commissions. And if you go out and make a million dollars in fees that year, they just got their five hundred back. Mm -hmm. So now that's what they're gambling on to try to get these power teams to come over. There's some great guys out there that are, that are doing those deals, but compared to going out on your own, I don't know what the fear is and why more people are going out on their own. But is it fear or is it the access to the cash to do it like so somebody who's getting commissions like that i would think and maybe this is just because that's how i live my life i think that there'd be a pile of money that builds up over time that i put in something is is there in force of real estate is that kind of flashy spend money on stuff that people are going to notice is that part of the culture i think it is a little bit i think that going back to where it's out of the show kicked off here just really learning yeah, this is a somewhat of a business that, you know, some people get into. Maybe their families are powerful families. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the bigger book shops are looking for those people in the house. And, you know, maybe there's an inheritance coming up, so I'm not so worried about things like that. Everybody's got to do something about it. Everybody's got to do a story. I go through life knowing that nobody's going to give me a book and a pen, but I'm going to be fine. Hmm. So, I don't know. Don't know. I don't know. What, what advice would you give to people that are in real estate to, like, I guess, advocate for why they should think about going so into it? Every, so every group, they'll go, uh, you're not for sports, right? So, I mean, that's how I first, when I left John, I was, by the way, when I worked for John for my entire 18 years and 10 months, I was a salary guy. You know, that but my buddies that were the bigger companies might have made big huge commissions and they were more and they were more. So at least I had a consistent and knew where I was. But I really didn't create the business. You know, I couldn't go ahead and put some huge deal on the big huge. But you got forced into having to manage your money because yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying. It was, it was a great deal for me at the time. And then halfway through that, I got married, so I thought I got a huge raise there. Right, feeling comfortable with this. I, mean, I think that's what happens to some of these guys because they just get comfortable. But the advice I'd give to anybody looking at this industry is first come talk to me. Which <laughs> same with um, but I'm not trying to grow some big company. I'm trying to uh, in fact I was listening to an audio book on my drive here at Force um, just trying to buy back my own time. Um, so Advice to people wanting to get in. I don't think there's anything wrong with them in beer shops. You learn a lot. Mm -hmm. They have the overhead to kind of train you in. I think they started as a researcher or something. And by the way, when I was young, I was thinking of this stuff a lot. Man, they're learning all that stuff like Collier's and Welsh and whatever, you know. And really, I was learning everything about the whole process. Mm -hmm. So they, were, they weren't they were getting it. They were going deep. I was getting the gold that's yeah. really, I was getting the stuff that I didn't realize that I was getting that's really paying. So you went, like you went really wide to understand yeah. all those things. And yeah. they're, they're in, they're right. getting trained into a brother. Because when you're that big, there's so much of specialization within the, the company, right? That somebody's in leasing and they learn leasing and they're the best in that. And they, but they don't really learn the brokerage side. And so with that's, that, that's how those big shops get paid. Mm -hmm. You gotta go make commissions. It's mm -hmm. you pay. So maybe they need to do to teach you how to go take care of land to make more to stay on top of that point. But now they're not going to be talking about marketing it or making sure that they understand how to develop it so that breadth that you get from a smaller shop creates more individual opportunity, but you don't have the same infrastructure and systems that CB has. But when somebody comes out and be, we don't sit them down there, don't get to all these forms and seriously working for a couple weeks and show you this, mm -hmm. they don't have all these processes, right? 
like, yeah. We hear it out. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And we, we want to hear it. will support the people. Yes. Why? Okay, this is the yes. other thing. Yes. They bring, they drive revenue. They're part of the real estate. Yeah. I mean, you have to support them. You have to support the power of people in your staff. People that are being paid out and myself. Go. You have to support those workers that are commissioned. And then you pay them. But back to people thinking about you, you this business. It's a delayed gratitude business. It's just delayed business. gratification. Yeah. You have to. You know, you know here's the good news is. I don't think he wears sweatpants, but he probably wore the same pair of jeans for an entire year. Two shirts. You know, when I was in, I had my ties for $85, but it was like, it seemed like my whole page. Mm -hmm. And you could drive an old rusty Honda Accord. Nobody cares anymore. That, I'm so thankful for that. that you know, I mean, you just want to dress the best you can and get things together. It's not that tough as it used to be. Well, you know, don't be doing Nothing your parents face in the fall after college, whatever you can do to keep your costs low. Keep your goals very, very high and your costs very, very low. It can only take you 10 years at some less than right there. If you have three or four kids right away on college, that's what you, that's your intentions, it's going to be very, very hard. It just is. I mean, here's a balance here. I talk to people at the top, and I'll be able to go my kids are pretty smart now and start reading. Do you want to be able to? Uh, Spend time with your kids or Yes. We all work long and hard for you. There's days you have to be. Kids are only kids for the first nine years. They start drifting off and shutting the door. Mm -hmm. And you have some sign of influence. And most people just decide that that's yours. And I think now that people look at the whole, there's more to you there. But when I was working for John, I was in the office. And most days, I was there by 6 o'clock. And I may have already gone to a property. And I was at the construction sites at 5 30, 6 o'clock. It's dark out in the headlights. Right now, I'm the Franklin planner. And, and I know contractors have called 4 7 or 8 or 9 to start calling brokers. I always call them over at 7 or 9. You can call me at 4 30 in the morning. So, be out at the construction sites, all the contractors. Subcontractors are working with Sit Downs and we'll address contractors. I was in a suit and tie every day. My Lord Wolf was walking in the mud and laughing. But my next meeting was showing some space. So, work hard when you don't have kids. Put in the hours. We worked, my buddies and I, and I had like four or five guys in their house for okay, three or bucks a week. Every one of us went to our office every Saturday morning from at least six or seven. Every Saturday. Just put work in. My buddies are still talking about that to this day. We're all sorry people. Why? Is that just the culture? We had no money to do it in the beginning, right? And B, we were trying to be something. You know what I mean? We didn't have, we had computers, internet, all these things taking over our time. And you might have been hungover, but at least you were there getting your desk in order, you are getting your notes in order, getting your faxes in order, whatever you needed to do money. It's kind of, you know, there's, it was just getting ready for the next week, or finishing mm -hmm. up something you didn't finish during the week. But those four hours, if I didn't do that on a Saturday, it would just be very possible. And then I never left the office. It was like a prep for the fall of not coming week. You had almost a dedicated time where you would ensure and prepare for success the following week. Yeah, but I mean, I was just trying to. Do my job, do a great job. I was a poet. You might not have thought about that. Man, if I thought the way I thought now, back then, or even at your age, I'd just be so. What, is, what do you wish you knew? At, what, you, what is the thing you wish you knew at that age? So, when I was, when I was a kid, uh, you were either in the, uh, the turtle, squirrel, or the rabbit reading room. And I was a turtle. I was a slow well, reader. So, I really like reading. Mm -hmm. And now I like that. I really love reading. For the content, right? And there's audiobooks. Mm -hmm. so, um, so much. The more I read, just the better I get reading. But I really do like reading. It's finding the time to read consistency. I think that's important. But for me, the reason I had made it and done really well 
is just hands on. I mean, I was loading Thunder Train and truck yesterday. Did I have to be? No. Because one of my partners mad at me. He's always mad for good physical work. I show up and I can run skid motors, front of motors. Like, I secretly want to be the maintenance guy. Right? <laughs> I just enjoy that. So that's how I was brought up, right? And I like to work with my hands. And I just do it. But this business is, especially the young woman. So you don't, so you go to CV and you just become a builder. And I'll be a builder. Sure, you can pay somebody on the weekends to fix your phones to install the washer and dryer. All these things I've done in the last couple of weeks. I do all that stuff myself. Now, you don't realize once you make it, and now you actually own buildings. And you walk into your building, and there's a pipe for you. Most of these guys walk in, they don't know what any of this stuff is. They know every single point that we were just doing, and the oldest building, where it's straight into it. If mechanically, if you mechanically inclined, which I'm extremely mechanically inclined as a kid, I still am. Those things all paid to me. It's just in being able to run a business. We have lawn crews and lawn equipment. That stuff shows up in the garage every weekend because everybody's trying to get it out. It takes me 30 seconds. I'm great for them to take it up to buy some years. Maybe you buy some years is great. You work in the room. But it's so what my partner buys says, how much money have you saved things you want? Stuff, but it's real. I get a first one. Just know a few things. Um, so read more and be willing to get your hands dirty. Yeah. Or is it understanding that getting your hands dirty is something that's led to you? You know, there's no shame in having dirty hands. I had a young man working for me for a while. I was going to enter this. I had some uh, imperfect installed in their piece. Now I got to check on those guys. I was just super happy to go there. It was being really nice to him. I needed a couple things for him. I asked if I could get him anything. And I uh, went back to my office and this guy confused me. Man, I just can't believe how nice she were. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, my parents have just been yelling at me. I need to be done. You know, this and that. And, and that, there's a mindset like that out there. People don't realize it. So that was one of the gifts I was given with for John. I had to motivate. You got to learn how to motivate contractors to work. Without them, you're nothing. I mean, people out here work. And that's just another one of those gifts I didn't think I had. Just in, but also, having done the work my whole life, really hard work, really it counts as everyone. If you know how to do that work, you'll appreciate more telling the person that's doing it. I'm being grateful that they're doing it and understanding what they're going through. If an electrician came in here right now and he's working on something on the roof and it's 20 below, he's in all his car, you know, he's in here at the panel, he's sweating, he's got to go back up to the cold back and forth. If you go through that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but you've all done it, right? But if you start to get to a certain level, there are not too many people that have that back. I just haven't done that either because they were raised that way or they don't think it's a good use of their time. Well, it's easy to, you know, my son Levi is eight, nine here in January. But he's had a pretty cushy life. But I also make him, I will you go, I make him do what I'm doing with children. And, uh, you know, he's not working as hard as I have. I think uh, you know, I'm still trying to teach him all those things. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, that these kids don't know that to you don't have those opportunities. But be willing to learn and want to do that. And you know, those things are going to count later once you own the buildings and the properties. Or while you're, while you're a broker now, if you want to get into this business, pay attention to those things, not just the art of the deal. Like Start the contractor you have yeah, fun in and what's the doing. I was a little kid when I was a kid, I was like, oh, okay. <clears throat> I can all imagine. I'd be over there, like grubby, looking under the hood of the truck. Like, what are you working on? You know, the water pumps. Like, oh, why, why, why? You know, and I wanted to help, and I would help because you learn that. So, but you don't realize that those are going to pay off later. You know, that you learning know. it for the later. You were learning it because you wanted to know the why. And now that you've asked why so many times in the fifty-four years you've been around, now you understand that. And through my experience with you, you probably don't even realize that other people don't know that. 
Yeah. And I forgot more than I'll ever learn. Yeah. So there's, but even, so when I was working in OR at Mercy Hospital, I was the same way. And when I went down into the break room with all the doctors and anesthetists, they were like, you got to get into this. Because I was curious, you know, I mean, they knew. Even that, like, I mean, we're doing a brain aneurysm, and I'm asking, like, what does that mean? And the doctor would take the time to sit. We had black and white monitors back there. So it's funny to think about. But he would, like, take his pencil and be pointing on the monitor what was wrong, what we're doing. Because he was my age, and I was young, 20, thinking about it. And what do I have left in life to give, right? Like, I just want to give and show others. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. The doctor knew that I was thinking about leading it into the medical field. I was curious. I wanted to learn. I was there. He's got nothing left. He's got all the money in the world. But why don't you show this young man or try to help him out? And then in the break room, he would talk to me about it. It was mm -hmm. just because you're curious. Or show sure. You're asking good questions. Show curiosity. Like if you're going to get into this business, show that you're curious. Or be. I think and if you see a contractor, sense. if you see a contractor, just stop and say hi to him and say, "Hey, I appreciate what you're doing." And if, it, if it doesn't seem like he's too crazy busy, ask him what he is doing. And learn to understand it because they're if they're in a building, you're showing a building or doing it. They're in your industry. Everything they're doing, you should understand. I don't care if they're putting up the garage door. You know, it's interesting. Learn to understand then. It's not like you speak a whole bunch of different languages, right? It's just the type of person they are and maybe a little bit of the language that they use with the service they provide. Right, let's go back to our electrician for here. Right? Okay. We don't know that. You and I just walked in the building. We see a truck out front that says Gephardt Electric. Guy's name's Tom. That's all we know about, right? Tom. Tom. Now we see Tom a second time. But the first time we just chat with him, kind of got to know him a little bit. Second time we've seen him. Uh, we'll talk to him a little bit more. That relationship might be the most important relationship in your life. And one month when you got a lexical problem. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tom, got a quick question for you. It's me, Matt. We just met. Yeah. You have to continue. The, the, the business, commercial real estate is all about relationships and having the solutions for your clients and tenants. So that's Tom, the, the electrician. And then you know the HVAC guy. And then you know the attorney. When you went to the closer, the guy that helped you at the lease, and then you met the guy at the bank, and then you met Matt at Abercadabra, and your tenants got to go. You don't really need to know a lot about anything. It's really relationships and just kind of having an overview of an understanding. But the more detail you do about those understandings. And by the way, how do I know so much about pest control? Hmm. Yeah, because, well, why? Because I, mean, I, 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 I want to be able to help you. I want to learn with you. I want to go and help you. Like, how can we? You don't. You don't seem like somebody that burns a lot of bridges. Is there somebody that taught you that? Or was there a lesson that you learned that from previously? Super funny to say that right now because uh, I was just working on a deal that fell apart. Like, thinking to myself, like, I don't think I have anybody that's like mad at me. I don't want to be made my way mad. And this was a residential broker that was just uh, working on one of our friends. He was like, gee, this guy turned me down. Crazy man, in the end. There, there's no reason to. I think that growing up in the environment that I grew up in, I was one of the popular kids, super poor, poor compared to others, wanting to be liked. I got to keep going back to my paper on every time I talk to somebody because if the customer asks you to put the paper right there, open the door, put it on the chair, or whatever it was, they're your customer. Mm -hmm. And you know, chocolate colored cherries, and that was the best Christmas gift. And sometimes you got some extra cash. Mm -hmm. The cash was king. So, whatever I had to do to, to make that person happy. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, it's just never been about the money. If somebody, if I mowed one month for somebody for four hours and the next guy paid me five, I wasn't mad at the four hour guy. But I did just as hard work the four hour guy, you know? That's just who you are. Okay. So, all right. So, if it's not about the money, what is it about? What this point teach my kids? Yeah, your grandfather now too, so. Grandpa. Grandpa <laughs> Jeff. Grandpa Jeff. Don't seem old enough to be a grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> and not just my kids, you know. Anybody around me. I think when you're younger, you're like, how am I going to get, when I was even your age, I was like, how am I going to get through this world alive? And I think you get to a point where you're like, 
I'm not saying like I'm loaded down enough money to make it to the end. It never is that. Like, I can start over tomorrow morning with zero and do it again. You, know, you already have the relationships, the knowledge. You, know, you can't take that away from you. And so at some point in your life, you cross that bridge. So my first year leaving John Allen, I was at zero. And somebody saved up. My, my wife had a good job. That takes some, some confidence, right? I was brown banking it every day. I had plenty of money in the bank. I just didn't want to spend any money because I didn't know when this thing was going to take off. Actually, my wife made me know when she was here to sing because uh, you guys love that. Mm -hmm. They're making a pound lunch and you're like four years old. You're like, yeah, that would be a good one. But I just think that you get to a point where that part doesn't matter so much. But seeing other people thrive, thriving doesn't have to be about money. It could be anything. You mean? But on the flip side of that, I really do have a hard time with people making you know, bad choices because I made them all. Like, nobody's perfect. You, know, you just got to be the best you can today. You know? mm -hmm. But when you see people that are maybe going to college for a long degree and spending a lot of money that they don't need to be spending, or, it's kind of like they're doing it because they're just lazy and like that's the process of what everybody does. And, they're not actually thinking... Nobody's thinking of only to pay off that student debt. Is this really worth it? What am I doing? Or am I just going to school? Well, I remember my experience then, and I was actually told to not think about that. Like, don't think about the money when it comes to picking college. Just pick the one that's going to be the best for you. It's this big butterfly, happy. It's all true. Yeah, but it's all government true. Yeah, it's it's a, well, because, I mean, college is just becoming more and more expensive. Everything's just like, yeah, but out uh, of you know, we both have people in for us. So they can be the best. You don't have to be, you don't have to run the company. You don't have to. There's just so many opportunities. There's just so many opportunities. You just never know where you're going to end up. I, mean, I certainly never thought I'd end up here. Hmm. Like, I knew that I'm going to do some great things, but I never. Like, my brothers and sisters were straight A students, and I was a DF student. So. All right. So. <laughs> We're going to be doing this some more, right? We're going to plan. Yeah, we, yeah, we're really going to go deep here. So you've got the breadth on all these different things. You've got the width. And now what we've been talking about is trying to bring the depth and those different things to other people within commercial space here in Minneapolis and, and abroad. So we could uh, start looking at some of the comments and getting some of the... Oh, yeah. We, we, we can get a lot of stuff there. there. So I mean, just a couple of things. Let me see ideas of what people are. I really think that whatever you're thinking about, go bigger. So that tells you. Hmm. Yeah, you said keep your goals high and your costs low. That's a that's a mic drop level point. Man, I got excited yesterday because I found like ten rolls of unwrapped toilet paper. Yeah. In the space. <laughs> like, like, we're gonna love this moving truck. I like, guess like he just doesn't care. You know, like, was it the two ply? Was it the double stuff? I gotta tell you this. Uh, I could bring it all. My wife only gets charm, but I think this stuff top the charm. But it's just little things like that. Like people, ten rolls of toilet paper. You know, toilet paper passes days. Some I just grabbed it. It was mine. The tenant left. The tenant left it there. Roll we'll paper towels. Like you're not gonna cut coupons and make it through life. That you don't have to be wasteful either. And just, yeah. Well, if you don't grab it now, you're choosing to spend twenty dollars on the next ten rolls. Of it's just great because when you want to buy a building, you're gonna, you, you know. I, we could go to Best Buy right now, and there's nothing you could buy me that I would be happy with because I'm going to crap. But when you get to a point in life where you're just like, why are you abandoning your car at Target because you have $100 of stuff in there and you went in there to buy razor blades? Just know that $90 you just saved by abandoning that car can go to your sand pile. You need my building someday in order to buy a real property or income producing property. Up to my gratification that. In real estate, you can't just get it right now. You don't need a snow bill. You can come and use mine. Sick. Thank you so much. Sir. All right. So anything else you want to say here before we log out? We'll be back probably in a week or so with some more. No, I appreciate the opportunity. I think it's a great idea. Thanks again for coming on the Homegrown House Layer today, Jeff. Looking forward to having you on more and really diving into the commercial real estate side of things. So, Super. Appreciate it. Look forward to the next one. Oh, man. I can't wait.